G'day, I'm Dr. Paul Mason. Dementia is a scary condition. In fact, surveys of elderly adults show it causes even more fear than cancer. And it's not hard to understand why. We fear being left in an empty shell of a body, disconnected from the outside world, totally reliant upon others. Now the term dementia is often used interchangeably with Alzheimer's disease, which is responsible for about 70% of cases. And given the magnitude of the problem, it probably shouldn't surprise you that drug companies are throwing billions of dollars at this problem. The problem is, despite huge amounts of money being spent, we're no closer to a cure than we were when it was first described a little over 100 years ago. And one of the major reasons for this is because billions of dollars are being pumped into genetics, ignoring the obvious fact that Alzheimer's is a modern disease even while our genetics haven't changed. Barely more than 100 years ago, it had never even been described, let alone seen at the colossal rates we're now seeing. To blame genetics for a modern disease makes no sense. Rather, Alzheimer's is a metabolic disease influenced by diet and lifestyle. This is an elegant study which clearly demonstrates this fact. It compared the rate of Alzheimer's disease in two genetically identical populations in different parts of the world. These two populations, recruited from Indianapolis in the USA and a single city in Nigeria, were historically linked by the slave trade, thus leading to their genetic similarity. So then, what do you think the investigators found? Well, in the USA where only 2% of the population over the age of 60 has been shown to be metabolically healthy, the rate of Alzheimer's disease was two and a half times greater than the genetically identical population in Nigeria. And this also holds true for those who carry the ApoE4 gene, commonly known as the Alzheimer's gene. It only confers an increased risk of dementia if you were not metabolically healthy. And given that rates of metabolic illness are increasing, it makes sense that the rate of Alzheimer's too is increasing. Indeed, the risk attached to carrying the ApoE4 gene appears to be increasing with time, despite the genetics being the same. For example, this older study found carrying the ApoE4 gene increased the risk of Alzheimer's by less than two, while modern studies can report risks of 10 times or more. And even then, this study found the increased risk only existed in patients with evidence of small blood vessel disease in their brain, something usually caused by metabolic disease. Essentially, the development of dementia is largely dependent on being metabolically unwell. But despite the fact that dementia rates are rapidly rising and genetics are not changing, we're still in the curious situation where the medical profession is still focusing on genetic risk factors. The vulnerability of the brain to metabolic illness is obvious when you consider that while it constitutes only 2% of the body's volume, it consumes over 20% of its energy. Indeed, dementia is often now referred to as type 3 diabetes, and we've got multiple lines of evidence linking poor metabolic health to dementia. For example, subjects who have an increased waist circumference which is a marker of visceral fat deposition and poor metabolic health, are three times more likely to develop dementia than their lean counterparts. Obesity too, quite literally, shrinks your brain, even for those in their 40s. So then, what to do? How do we prevent dementia? We'll start by avoiding processed foods which are often loaded with seed oils and fructose-containing sugars. You see, these substances are uniquely harmful to our metabolic health, and when consumed habitually, they can be devastating to our brain. Let's begin them with sucrose, commonly known as table sugar. The thing that makes it so bad is that it contains exactly 50% fructose, pretty similar to what is in high fructose corn syrup. And fructose, quite specifically, contributes to metabolic sickness, which includes fatty liver disease and insulin resistance the end result of which is elevated levels of sugar in the blood, known as diabetes. This study clearly showed the metabolic harm of fructose-containing sugars. 41 children who habitually consumed high levels of fructose-containing sugar had the fructose replaced 
with glucose. Essentially, their fructose intake went from 12% of their energy intake to 4%, while their total carbs and energy intake was kept constant. In just nine days, their average liver fat reduced by more than 30%. And not surprisingly, this was also accompanied by big reductions in insulin levels, all after just nine days of reducing fructose-containing sugar. The point is, fructose-containing sugars can be devastating for our metabolic health. Let's now take a look at seed oils. By virtue of their chemical structure, polyunsaturated oils are prone to something called oxidative damage. These double bonds, present in all unsaturated fats, are chemically reactive and prone to something called oxidation. And this is why when we heat unsaturated fats, they produce far more toxic compounds than their saturated counterparts. And you'll note that olive oil, which is largely monounsaturated, meaning it contains a single oxidation-prone double bond rather than the multiples found in polyunsaturated seed oils, is something of a halfway house. Not as oxidation-prone as seed oils, but not as stable as saturated fat. It should be noted there's no compelling evidence that olive oil is superior in any way for health to saturated fat. And heating these oils absolutely increases their toxicity. However, even unheated, as you might use in a salad, they still pose problems. This graph shows the progressive oxidation of walnut oil over a matter of days, long before it would get to the supermarket, let alone onto your salad. And you should also know that omega-3 oils, being polyunsaturated, are also oxidation prone, perhaps even more than their omega-6 counterparts. And even when multiple antioxidant compounds are added to omega-3 oils, they still oxidize. Take this 2020 study which found that while adding a cocktail of antioxidants did indeed reduce the oxidation, it didn't eliminate it levels of oxidation were still significant, even just over a few days. And this Australian study, every brand of fish oil tested had detectable oxidation products, with 38% of samples even failing a voluntary industry standard. And it's likely the fish oil oxidation is one of the main reasons why the vast majority of studies looking at fish oil do not find any benefit. In fact, 16 of the 18 studies in this review listed here did not find any advantage to fish oil supplementation. This is likely because when we consume oxidized oils, we absorb the oxidation products. The more oxidized the oil, the more we absorb. It doesn't matter whether it's a fish oil or a seed oil. Compare the absorption of oxidation products from a low oxidized oil and a highly oxidized oil, and have no doubt circulating oxidation products are harmful to our health. It's also important to know that the combination of elevated blood glucose levels, such as seen in poorly controlled diabetes, effectively multiplies the dose of oxidation from these oils. Compare the absorption of oxidation levels in those with normal blood glucose levels to those with high blood glucose levels. And not only was the amount of oxidation product absorbed much, much greater, they remained in the circulation for far longer. Eight hours versus three days, nine times longer. And the combination of fructose containing sugars and oxidized oils is what makes so many processed foods literally toxic to our brain. Most processed foods contain at least one and commonly both of these ingredients. Have no doubt processed foods are absolutely implicated as a major cause of Alzheimer's disease. Let's take a look at what happens inside your brain to see how processed foods can be so damaging. Clumps of damaged proteins known as beta amyloid plaques define Alzheimer's disease, being thought to cause much of the damage. And until relatively recently, we could only identify beta amyloid by microscope after death. Now, however, it can be visualized while still alive. Here you can see advanced brain imaging demonstrating the brain of an Alzheimer's patient riddled with beta amyloid. These beta amyloid plaques 
are aggregates of individual beta amyloid peptides. But these peptides don't naturally just clump together. Rather, they have to be damaged first. And this is where sugar and seed oils come in. In the presence of sugar, these beta amyloid peptides can form early glycation products through the process of covalent binding or chemical attachment of sugar to the peptide. And glycation of the beta amyloid peptides makes them prone to clumping together and progressing to advanced glycated end products, which are essentially what the beta amyloid plaques are. And this final step can be enhanced by oxidative stress. The same oxidative stress experienced on consumption of oxidized seed oils. The end result, these beta amyloid plaques, which are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, are scattered throughout the brain. Now, as I mentioned before, genetics is often blamed for Alzheimer's disease, especially the well-known ApoE4 gene. The ApoE gene can be found on the 19th chromosome, and it comes in three flavors, ApoE2, E3, and E4. And everyone has two of these genes, one from each parent, and it is the combination of two ApoE4s which is most strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease. And having two of these genes confers probably about a five times greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But here's the thing, genetics is not fate. Just because you happen to have two E4 genes does not consign you to a fate of dementia. It is, I believe, dependent on metabolic health. Those in good metabolic health irrespective of E4 status, do not have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. The ApoE gene serves as the blueprint for this protein, which is embedded within the membrane of HDL cholesterol particles. And HDL particles in the brain act as a natural defense against beta amyloid deposition, because it can actually remove them. That's right, HDL particles in the brain by way of the ApoE protein can remove beta amyloid. Now the ApoE3 variant is by far the most common, while the less common ApoE4 is the one that gets all the bad press. This is the one that is especially vulnerable to damage because of its unique molecular structure. You'll recall how beta amyloid peptides can be damaged both by sugar stress or glycation and oxidative stress from oxidized oil consumption. Well, the ApoE protein can also be damaged in the same ways. And it just so happens that the E4 variant, by virtue of its particular molecular structure, is especially prone to this. We have clear evidence from this paper which compares the tendency of the ApoE3 protein to form advanced glycated end products to the ApoE4 protein. The E4 variant is damaged by advanced glycated end products at three times the rate. Now consider for a moment what this means. If you carry ApoE4 and are not metabolically healthy, the HDL particles in your brain which remove toxic protein deposits are less likely to be able to function. This tendency for glycation damage if you were not metabolically healthy is why those with the ApoE4 genotype on average are about five times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And when you consider that about 98% of US adults over the age of 60 are not completely metabolically healthy, you can see why having the ApoE4 gene might not be such a good thing. The thing is, if you are metabolically healthy into old age, then having the ApoE4 variant likely doesn't matter. The formation of advanced glycated end products is a manifestation of metabolic disease. And there's also other consequences of dysfunctional HDL particles which occur due to glycation and oxidation stress. This study looked at the activity of an enzyme called matrix metalloproteinase 9 in HDL particles, which were normal and those which were dysfunctional. And it was clearly shown that when HDL particles became dysfunctional, the activity of this matrix metalloproteinase 9 increased dramatically. And the reason this is a problem is because matrix metalloproteinase 9 has been shown to disrupt something called the blood-brain barrier. 
The blood-brain barrier basically prevents certain circulating substances in our blood from crossing into the nervous system, where our brain resides. And disruption of the blood-brain barrier is an early biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. And this significance was demonstrated in this paper from last year, which was published in Nature. It clearly showed increases in blood-brain barrier dysfunction, which were caused by matrix motoloproteinase 9 levels, were higher in those carrying the ApoE4 protein, making their HDL particles prone to damage. So the link is, carry ApoE4, your HDL is more likely to be damaged, that reduces your ability to remove the beta amyloid plaques and leads to disruption of your blood-brain barrier. So there are compelling arguments that highly processed foods by virtue of their seed oil and sugar content can cause dementia. But what evidence is there for the benefit of ketogenic diets in those already in the early throes of dementia? Well, there's compelling evidence that ketones can provide significant energy to the brain. This scan shows firstly, the utilization of ketones in the brain of someone on a standard high carb diet. And again, in the same person after commencing a ketogenic diet. And this is important because it allows us to bypass an energy block in the brain of those with Alzheimer's disease. You see, while a normal brain is quite able to make use of circulating glucose for energy, the Alzheimer's brain is not. This is due to something called insulin resistance and leads to large areas of the brain which are effectively starved of energy and unable to function normally. Contrast the supply of energy to brain tissue from glucose on the left to ketones on the right in a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And this is why I often hear the description of somebody coming alive when they enter ketosis. Ketones which are produced on very low carbohydrate diets literally can allow an insulin resistant brain to again begin to function. This is the average level of brain activity in elderly patients at baseline and then after they commenced a ketogenic diet. Contrast this with the results seen on the American Heart Association recommended diet. Absolutely no benefit whatsoever. The ketogenic diet is clearly superior to the low fat American Health Association diet. And this recent paper from Nature not only confirms the reduced ability of brain cells in Alzheimer's disease to use glucose for energy, but it also found they used energy less efficiently. Here you can see that not only are the brain cells in Alzheimer's disease working harder, even at rest, but they waste more energy, which rather than supporting cellular function, contributes to oxidative stress. And not only does a ketogenic diet improve current brain function and prevent damage, this paper showed low carbohydrates diets could even reverse existing damage. After eating a standard diet for a week, subjects had a brain scan which measured brain deterioration. The same subjects were then fed a keto diet for a week, followed by another brain scan. The result being less brain deterioration was identified on the second scan, after eating a keto diet for only a week. So it doesn't matter which way you look at it. Diet matters in dementia. Diets low in sugar and seed oils can help prevent dementia, while ketogenic diets can improve the function in those who already have dementia. And there is absolutely no substantive evidence at all that those at risk of dementia, including those with the ApoE4 gene, should avoid saturated fat. Quite to the contrary, and given dementia can really be considered type 3 diabetes, a metabolic disease of the brain, any recommendation to take cholesterol-lowering statins, drugs shown to increase the risk of diabetes and worsen blood sugar control should really be questioned. At the end of the day, dementia is largely a disease of lifestyle and not genetics. So rather than worrying about whether you are an ApoE4 carrier, you'd be far better off making sure you eat well, sleep well and exercise well. Thank you.